Good morning, everybody. If it's your first time here, if you're a regular attender, we are incredibly happy to have you. Please stand as we worship our Lord this morning. And I get my pages in the right order. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there is body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost. church. Happy Easter. It is very good to have you in the house of the Lord today. I want to um, teach you a couple things that I think are special for Easter, a little call and response. And uh, I'm going to say he is risen. And the response to that is he is risen indeed. So we'll just keep working on it until we all have it going like a pep rally. 
And then the other thing, if I say praise the Lord, you say amen. Okay, so we're going to try this. I say, he is risen. You say? He is risen indeed. Oh, that was a good first time. Let's do it again. I say, he is risen. You say? He is risen indeed. I say, praise the Lord. You say? Amen. Awesome. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. It almost reminds me of being in church in Africa. You guys are good at this. Very good. All right, so um, there are a couple of announcements I wanted to make. Uh, just so those of you who are not aware, uh, we have our Marriage Matters, Marriage Mondays, uh, that begin on uh, April the 12th. That's a week from Monday, tomorrow. And uh, is there, there's still space available, so if you'd like to... Uh, be a part of that. This is not for people whose marriages are about to fall apart. These are, it's like uh, you go to the, get your oil changed, you go and get your tire pressure checked on your car. You just don't want to have a bump in the road, right? Um, there's a whole other thing when you rebuild an engine. And so we have ca counseling for those kinds of situations. But basically, what this is, is an opportunity for us as Christian couples to develop uh, both intimacy and communication. And those are things that we want in our lives and in our marriages. So please uh, go to the webpage and uh, register for that if you haven't already and you'd like to be a part of it. Also, um, I wanted to announce that as we continue to, in this season, to raise money for North American missions, uh, we want to highlight the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Uh, our goal is... 3,500 and we're about two-thirds of the way there so um, that's great but if you have not had an opportunity to give in this way uh, I would just ask that you pray over it how much the Lord would have you give this is above and beyond your regular tithe and offering but we want to support missions because we believe it's important that everybody hear the gospel in a way that they can respond so um, now that we uh, are all together, let me try this once again. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Praise the Lord. Amen. You guys are amazing. Let us pray. Thank you, God, so much for the opportunity to come and to celebrate this Easter morning, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, whom you willingly gave. Having loved us to the full, he gave up his life that we might receive him and believe in his name. And so we celebrate this victory over sin and death in our lives. And we pray, Father, that as we respond in faith to you, that you will receive our worship as a fragrant aroma before the throne of heaven. That in all that we do, you will be blessed all honor, all glory, all praise to you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, I caught you on that one. Caught you sleeping. Praise the Lord. He is risen. Hallelujah. We're going to be in the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter today, as we commemorate the day that our Lord rose from the grave and left the tomb empty. This is what the Bible says. On the first day of the week, early in the morning, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had already been removed from the entrance of the tomb and so she ran to tell Simon Peter and the disciple the one whom Jesus loved she said to them they have taken away the Lord and we do not know where they have placed him Peter and the other disciple set out to the tomb. Now they were running together, but the other disciple was faster than Peter. 
So he got to the tomb first. And when he got there, he bent over and looked inside and saw that the linen wrappings were laying there. Then Peter, who was running behind, made it to the tomb and went inside. He saw the linen wrappings there and noticed the face covering which had been on his head was laying separated from the linen wrappings. It had been rolled up and set by itself. Then the other disciple, the one who got there first, went into the tomb and when he saw, he believed. For they had not yet understood the scriptures that Jesus would be raised from the dead. Then the disciples went away to their own homes, but Mary stayed behind at the entrance of the tomb, weeping. As she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb, and she saw in the place where Jesus had been laid, two angels in white, one at the head and one at the foot. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she explained to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have placed him. And when she had said this, she turned behind her and saw, am I still on? Turned behind her and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not recognize that it was him. And he said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who do you look for? And she assumed he was the gardener and said to him, Sir, if you have removed the body, tell me where you've placed him and I will get him myself. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned to him and put her full attention on him. She said, Rabbi, which in Aramaic means teacher. Then Jesus said to her, stop, don't hold on to me. I am ascending to the Father. Instead, go to my brothers and sisters and tell them that I am going to my father who is your father. I am ascending to my God who is also your God. And so Mary went to the disciples and told them the good news. I have seen the Lord. And then she reported everything that Jesus had told her. That empty tomb is one of the most significant symbols of our faith. Without the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, our whole faith is in vain. And so that empty tomb, that vacant grave, stands as a symbol of Jesus' victory over sin and death. And that's why even to today we celebrate this day and we say, He has risen. We say, praise the Lord. Indeed, he has risen. And so when we look at this story, uh, we see it through the eyes of John, the beloved disciple. Uh, have you noticed how this story is told? It's like he finally gets to rip on his companion, Peter. There's that, that intimacy between them, like brothers, that... Um, 
close companionship that's competitive, uh, that little rivalry. If you go through and count how many times John brags, you'll know how many years Peter had to put up with it. Luke even reports that they were always connected in the early church. John and Peter were the ones who would go story after story for the first eight chapters doing ministry. So now we know that when Peter wasn't preaching, he was listening to John say, can you walk a little faster? Are you going to be as slow as you were the day of the tomb? You know. So when we look at Peter through John's eyes, even though he's somewhat gracious in the way he tells the whole story, we see that in the character of Peter, there's this weakness, there's this tendency for failure. And so what I want to do is to kind of look at both at Peter and John and Mary today. So we call the sermon Peter, John, and Mary, but then I thought that sounded too much like uh, folk music and Americana. But that will at least give you a mnemonic device for putting a structure around the sermon. And so Peter, what we learn from him is that our personal failures cannot diminish our fight for the faith. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, Peter gave his undying loyalty to the Lord. I will go with you even if I have to die to you. I'll be with you to the end. And Jesus said, well, by the time the rooster crows in the morning, you'll have denied me three times. And so it's like this destiny of Peter to fail despite his attempts to follow along. And, and John, you know, if you really watch the way John tells the story, he names Peter as the, the person at the arrest who stands up and draws the sword. He's like, he's got it confused. It's like John wants to make sure we know that that Peter's the one who pulled out the sword and decided to be a warrior. And instead of actually like injuring the man in a way that he couldn't fight, he only was able to cut off an ear. I think that's the way we're supposed to read it. That even when he decided to be a warrior for the faith, instead of a, instead of a follower, that he failed. Jesus then rebukes him. So he's failed again, and at a distance, he and the beloved disciple follow Jesus when all the other disciples are scattered to their own places where they go into hiding. And John lets us know that it was he that got them in the door so that Peter could stand by the fire. And as Peter continues through that night, indeed, he hides his connection to Jesus again and again, denying that he even knows Jesus. It's always like Peter is one step behind John, isn't it? It's like he always wants to get there, but he's just missing the moment. Can you imagine Peter was the closest disciple to Jesus? He knew him the best. He fought the hardest to be with him. And throughout the whole ministry, when it finally culminates and we get to the climax where Jesus does what he came to do, what he said he would accomplish, when he goes to die on the cross, is buried and raises again, Peter keeps coming up empty. He's not there at the cross. He's not there at the grave. And when he runs there in the morning, he finds an empty tomb. And I think that can be a message for us, that there's ways that each of us experience disappointment and disillusionment. We feel like we can never measure up. We feel like we're not good enough. We feel like we can't make an impact the way we want to make an impact. We can't be as good of a follower of Jesus as we want to be. We find that there's something inside ourselves, some piece of failure that always keeps us from achieving how we dreamed it would be, how we thought it would be. But here's the message from Peter, don't stop chasing the dream. Don't stop fighting for the faith. You were never good enough to begin with. And so keep pushing as best you know how. One of the things I love about this story is that that John gets there first. Craig and I were talking about this earlier this week. We said it's like he's really rubbing this whole thing in that he's faster and stronger and all this stuff. He's probably a decade and a half younger 
Come on, young guys, it's hard for us old guys to keep up with you, right? I mean, probably John didn't even have his beard yet. So, like, of course he's going to outrun him. So when Peter gets there and John's doing a few calisthenics and push-ups at the door to kind of rub it in, Peter doesn't stop. You know, he's the first one to run out to the tomb, even though John passes him by. And then he just, when he gets there, he doesn't wait and stoop and look in. He goes right into the tomb and to see what is going on. I think the message for us is fight it. Fight the good fight. Press on. Push forward. Don't let your failures define you. Don't let your failures diminish your faith. Go after it again and again. Then there's the next, as the scene develops, John follows inside the tomb. There's just a simple phrase here. He saw and he believed. Seeing is believing. He said the reason that they didn't realize what was going on before is because they had not yet understood the scriptures that Jesus would raise again from the dead. But the reason that John can go in and see and believe is because he has a biblical perspective. John has been the one who's been connecting the dots all along. He was the one who stayed with Jesus and watched from a distance and shows up at the cross with the women. When he sees the way that Jesus dies, he sees it as if the pages of Scripture are turning. He connects the dots and sees that this Messiah, this good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep, has died on the cross. He testifies that he is the eyewitness. And his testimony is true that you might believe. And then he points out the scripture. Jesus is the fulfillment of all those Passover lambs that came before. Every time a lamb was sacrificed and offered in place of a firstborn, every time that they commemorated through the death of the lamb, God's deliverance for them out of slavery, it was pointing to the lamb of God who was slain, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so John, when he sees the Roman soldiers come and break the legs of the criminals hanging on the cross to his right and to his left so that they would die quickly. He notes that when they came to Jesus they did not need to break his leg because he had already given up his spirit willingly. He was dead already. And so what John says is connect the dots. That Passover lamb, that perfect lamb that had no blemish which not even a bone could be broken is pointing to the perfection of the innocent one the righteous one who on the cross though he hung there to die not a single bone was broken make the connection this is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and he knows that because he knows the scripture and then When he sees the lance pierce Jesus' side and blood and water flow from his side. He remembers the prophetic word of Zechariah. That they will look upon the one whom they have pierced. Jesus fulfills that longing desire of Zechariah and all the prophetic hope. That God would pour out a spirit on the house of David, and on all the residents of Jerusalem, that they would have a king who would come, who would be pierced for their transgressions, and then they would look upon him knowing in grief and sorrow and mourning and in bitter weeping that the one they had pierced was their king. And Zechariah said, they will grieve for him like one grieves for an only 
child. They will mourn for him bitterly like a firstborn. See, because John is aware of the scriptures, when he sees it happen, it's as if scripture is playing out right before his eyes. And so when he comes to the tomb, he's not only the first in speed to get there, he wants us to know he's the first to figure it out. Seeing is believing. And so what we can learn from John's testimony is that the scripture must explain our experience of the faith. Scripture must explain our experience of the faith. Too many times we are experiential. We take our sense of logic, how we've lived in the world. We take our uh, experiences as primary and the scripture as secondary. I, I felt that God was calling me to do that and then I, I want to ask, like, if God's calling you, how does that align with the scriptures? Whatever experience we have, whatever theology we develop, whatever our decisions are, how we decide to move in the world must have an explanation in scripture or we probably are getting it wrong. That's why it's important to hear the word of God, to read the word of God, to study the word of God, to memorize the scripture and to meditate on it. Because then, in your life, you will see the scriptures play out before you. And you will know what God has said to you. That's how you know. The person who I am most drawn to in this story is Mary, though. She, um, she has awaited that sunrise moment, the first day of the week. You see, in, a, in observance of the Sabbath, the high Sabbath during Passover week, no one has come to the tomb for a day. They're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath. Mary's been waiting. And when this chapter opens, we hear that on the first day of the week, early in the morning, while it was still dark, she made her way to the tomb. She was going to be there first. She wanted to anoint the body with spices. She comes to the tomb and finds that the stone which had blocked the mouth of the tomb had been rolled away from the entrance. She doesn't know what to do. Everything is, everything's wrong. Everything that she planned, every way that she wanted to honor the Lord, where is the Lord and all this? She can't even find him, so she takes off and goes and calls the others, Peter and John. Come! They've taken, they've taken the body. We don't know where they've placed it. And then when the disciples return to their homes, Mary remains behind at the entrance of the tomb weeping. Grief. The feeling of loss. Mourning. And through her tears she peers in the tomb. What an, a miraculous moment that was. Instead of just seeing the linens laying in the place where Jesus was, she sees at the head and the foot of that place Angels dressed in white, startled. They speak to her, woman, why are you weeping? Why weep? She explains, they've taken the, the Lord. They've taken my Lord. I don't know, don't know where they've taken him. And she kind of turns and looks behind and Jesus is standing there. She doesn't know that it's him. He's just standing there. And he says the same words, Woman, why do you weep? Who are you looking for? 
and she assumes he's the gardener. She says, well, wherever you've taken them. Like, if you've removed them from here and put them somewhere else, which could be expected because, you know, people who have died on crosses, they're not important. Often the bodies were discarded for the dogs. That was part of the, the punishment. So she says she doesn't want that to happen. She wants to honor the body. Where have you put them? I'll get them myself. I'll take them off your hands. This is the moment that I love the most in the story. Jesus says her name. Right? And that familiar voice rings the way he says it. Mary. That moment she turns her full attention to the Lord. And she leaves They've been speaking Greek, right? This is a, a Roman territory, officials, this is a Greek. It, it's remembered in their native Hebrew language of Aramaic. She says, Rabboni, like, my teacher, you're the one. She turns to him, and what we assume, we can only pick from the dialogue, is that she goes to embrace him. And whether she's clung to his feet or she's wrapped her arms around him, we do not know. But we know that Jesus is saying, hold on. This is not the ultimate moment. It's not just that you hang on to me. This resurrection is not for you only that we can be together. Don't stay in this moment, but go. As I ascend to the Father, you go and tell the brothers and sisters, my family, tell them. And we're not talking about family of birth. We're talking about the disciples because Mary understands the instructions and goes to the disciples. Here's one more indication that the family of God is more intimate, more close, more primary than the natural family. Mary gives us a lesson here. That our love for the Lord must be played out in action. Our love for the Lord is not just for us to hold him, to hug him, to remain with him, to stay with him. That's important. We want to abide with the Lord, but it doesn't stop there. It's not just for you. You're not saved for you. You're saved for those who have not yet heard that the Lord has risen. Praise the Lord. So she goes and tells them that she personally has seen the resurrected Lord and she explains everything that Jesus told her. Hear what Jesus told her. I ascend to my father. Who is? Your father. I ascend to to my God. Who is? Your God. Here's the proclamation that Mary is giving. That through Jesus Christ we have an eternal adoption. We are eternally reconciled with God Almighty. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus what we learn is that God has sealed the deal on your eternal security in his family. He has invited you to share in the relationship that he has with his one and only son. From the very first chapter, this is what John told us. To those who received him, those who believed in his name, he gave them the right, that's the birthright, to become children of God. That's why to the family of God, he can say, my father is your father. My God is your God. It reminds me of an Old Testament story. I don't know if you know this one. There's a book written about it, the book of Ruth. One of the main characters, Naomi, uh, is uh, with her two daughter-in-laws. Her husband has died. Her sons have died. She's a widow and all alone. She tells her daughter-in-laws to go back to their families and go to their own people. But Ruth says, where 
where you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. That's covenant language. I am going to be with you until the day we die. And now Jesus is using that same kind of language. There's no place else for you to go. You are part of my family. My father is your father. My God is your God. You are mine. So that's why we don't just sit and enjoy the Lord and pray and meditate, but we also want to put our faith into action. Because we need to proclaim the truth that if you receive the Son of God, if you receive Jesus Christ, if you believe in his name, he gives you the right to become God's child. And that's a permanent adoption. Jesus knows about eternity. He's eternal and he plays for keeps. And once he has you, he's not going to let you go. So my prayer is, as you've come on this Easter morning to commemorate the resurrection of our Lord, that you would examine your life. If your personal failures and shortcomings are standing as an obstacle in your way to live out your life in faithfulness, take a lesson from Peter. Be the fool that runs headlong into the grave looking for the Lord. Don't let your personal shortcomings, your your mistakes, your failures define you. Don't let them diminish your faith. Fight it out to the end. And if you're exuberant about the faith let scripture be your guide let it explain your experience we are not primarily experiential people what we want to experience is truth in its fullest form the truth that is Jesus Christ the truth that is according to scripture and so we test everything that we do with scripture let your witness be personal indeed but let it be scriptural and then finally if you are one of those folks who say I I don't live my faith out I don't like to be one of those radical people who have their faith on their sleeves and everybody has to know and you've been keeping Jesus to yourself break out of that grave Break out of that that place. Don't just hang on to Jesus for dear life for yourself. He's saying, don't worry, you're not going to lose me. I ascend to the Father. You don't have to hold on. I'm not going anywhere. I am with you. Go and tell. I just want to say this very clearly. God intentionally places people in your life that need to hear the message. Is that clear? There is someone in your family, in your neighborhood, in one of the clubs that you're a part of, in one of the social organizations, in your business. There is somebody that God has placed you in their life so that he can tell them, I love you so much that I gave my one and only son to die for you that your sins would be covered and that you could become a child of God. So don't let another year pass you by without talking to that person, without telling them of your experience of the Lord, without sharing the good news, announcing to them, the Lord has risen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, your only Son, We receive our salvation 
through him alone. We thank you, Savior, for laying down your life in our place that we might be eternally reconciled to God. And come, Holy Spirit, fill our lives and give us the strength and endurance to put our faith into action. This is our prayer. Amen.